Good morning. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io, and I'm here today with Ellis McHugh, the CEO of Territory Foods. Good afternoon, Ellis. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. And it's just turned afternoon where you are, correct? It just turned afternoon. I'm on the very, very cold East Coast right now, staying bundled up and trying to stay healthy uh, during, you know, the craziest year of all time. Yes. Well, the probably the second. Let's hope this is the second craziest year. <laughs> it is a new year now. Um, yeah, I, I forget that it's not 2020 any longer because it feels like 2020 part two, but absolutely. <laughs> it does. I know it really does. <laughs> so I think it's just going to be the early 20s is going to be just a period of time, right? Exactly. We're all looking forward to spring here on the East Coast. We're going to get some of that California sunshine, hopefully, and everyone's going to go outside and everything's going to just feel a little bit better when it's warm, for sure. I know. It's, it's funny. It, just a side note. My mom just got her second flu shot or vaccine shot. Mm -hmm. and she wanted to go outside so bad and she does live near you. She's like, I can't go out. <laughs> it's no, just no. too cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad she got it though. She can start going to the grocery store. She can start, you know, seeing her friends again. I think it's just going to be great for everybody's mental health and we'll just trickle it in. And then by summer, everybody's going to take a collective vacation. My thing is, I think the United States is going to go on a nice summer break this year um, and just see all the people they haven't seen and do all the things that they haven't been able to do. I agree. I think VRBO is going to be very popular this summer. <laughs> yes, totally. VRBO, Airbnb, they're already like hot, hot, hot. I think they're going to go even crazier for sure. Yeah, I would agree. So let's, let's ask about you now. Well, um, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Yeah, for sure. So I started my career in uh, consulting. I was a technology management consultant with Deloitte Consulting for about six years and had the pleasure of deploying large-scale Oracle ERP systems all over the world, which is the... I don't want to say the worst, but it's one of the most dry forms of technology, um, but really gave me this amazing experience of seeing businesses from the inside and being able to pick apart the parts that were more complex than others and really ask clients, why do we have this complexity in our operation and how can we make it more efficient? And that's the best thing about Oracle is that it's, it's standard right? It's standard for a reason. And if you're doing something different, it should be driving value for you and your business. And it kind of started my thesis on complexity in the supply chain and operation that I've taken forward through my whole career. Um, I went from Deloitte Consulting after six years to Gap Inc. and was lucky mm -hmm. enough to work with the part of the Gap Inc. world that is called Strategic Alliances. Um, and it's a really special group that in the 1990s and early 2000s took the power of the Gap brands uh, to franchisees throughout the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and set up franchise agreements with the best in class franchisees that really knew their markets um, and had grown the business to 44 international markets by the time that I came in. Um, and it was incredible because the whole process had been very, very business development focused. And when I came in, the supply chain was causing a lot of challenges for the franchisees. Product was taking longer. It was more expensive. And all the retail agreements had started to kind of fall apart. Um, so I came in at this beautiful moment where you have these customers that are lusting after these classic American brands and our supply chain challenge was to make it lighter, faster, more efficient. But what we actually got to do was start building product that was even closer to the customer and working with those franchisees to say, what does the Saudi Arabian Gap customer want? And how do we talk to them intimately and closely and really bring in the data that we know about that customer into the design cycle, which was amazing and really um, reflective of what the cool kind of innovative direct-to-consumer brands in San Francisco were doing at that time, like Everlane, Rothy's, Bonobos all these model changers that were using this direct to consumer relationship to get closer to the customer. Um, it was like my little microcosm of being able to do it at Gap, you know, the $16 billion company. Um, <laughs> So a lot of fun there and really just an incredible organization with amazing values, um, just at two Embarcadero and this incredible feeling of we are doing something bigger for the world. Um, and I loved it and got to tweak the international supply chain, get closer to that customer. Then after about uh, three years with Gap, I shifted over to a company called ZX Ventures and uh, it's the venture capital and innovation arm of AB InBev. And they had recruited me because at this point in my career, I have a very weird skill set. Um, so finance, consulting, mm. supply chain, operations, P&L management, and merchandising. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird one. And so ZX Ventures was founded by uh, Pedro Earp in uh, like the 2017 timeframe where he basically said, beer has been disrupted by the craft beer movement. We want to build an organization that focuses on identifying the next disruptors and gets ahead of them. And so he started verticals in e-commerce, in non-alcoholic and health and wellness and things like that. And why they brought me in was to say, how do we leverage the power of the 350 
brands that we have nationally that have just years and years, sometimes centuries of heritage. And how do we build a closer relationship for the customer with that brand without without selling them alcohol? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a super cool challenge. It was a uh, very, very broad challenge. And so I went broad, I went deep. I launched um, nine direct-to-consumer businesses in two years um, across 14 different categories of products. So glassware, apparel, we did a fair amount of licensing, housewares, food, all these different categories. And really thinking about how do you build brand love for different brands that have, you know, different, different customer segments who use the product differently and just kind of remind them of why they love that brand without actually transactionally selling them alcohol. Uh, so it was super fun and I did it for two years, but I will say I spent 75% of my time on the road, um, which is just a very long time. Uh, I was, you know, I'm happily married and wanted to spend a little bit more time with my family, but then also was really looking at my, my own personal health and, you know, starting in consulting where truthfully you abuse your body and then kind of transitioning into this high travel kind of high velocity career with CX ventures. Um, my health had really started to fall apart and I was really looking for my next move to go deep in the space of health and wellness. I am a firm believer that what you put in your body impacts how you feel. And mm -hmm. that's how you feel physically. Like if you feel fat or bloated or, or weak, but then also how you feel mentally. And I really believe that eating the right diet can help you feel um, sharp, focused, and all these like really important things to me as a businesswoman. Um, so I started looking around and I said, who is doing really innovative things in the health and wellness category? And who's doing innovative things in food? Because food is kind of like stodgy. I would say like the CPG world of food is very, very rudimentary. And I had gotten a little bit of that at AB and Dev, how the selling process works and how the innovation cycle takes six, nine, 12 months and these giant engines to make any sort of innovation. And taking that knowledge that I had of the direct-to-consumer world from my time at Gap, watching, you know, the Everlane's Bonobos Rothies of the world kind of shift. And then my experience launching from zero to one with the X Ventures, um, I found territory. Uh, and I said, this is a really interesting business that has a super strong core proposition and is ready to scale. So I'm not the founder of Territory. <laughs> That's what I will say. Mm -hmm. I'm midpoint in this story. But Territory was founded in 2012. We are a fresh food platform that works through a network of over 40 different chefs and restaurants. And so um, our chefs craft incredible meals every single week for our customers that are both delicious and healthy and really focused on driving a better life for our customers and then uh, helping them you know, serve locally and actually work with their local economies rather than kind of saying, okay, I need to get healthy. I have to be buying food from you know, industry city, California or uh, Northern New Jersey, where it's going to get shipped across the country for me. Um, so we do a really beautiful job for our customers. We help them when they're trying to empower a different part of their life. So they may be trying to get control of their blood pressure. They may be trying to lose weight, or they may just be trying to be a work from home mom, trying to keep it all together. Um, we offer them the highest variety of product and the highest quality so that they're never let down. They're always really excited by what they're eating and it makes it crazy easy to eat well. So we are super lucky to have great, great, excellent uh, physical product enabled by our chef network. But then what I think is really interesting for this audience as well is that we actually have an incredible data science organization and um, algorithm that runs on the back end of our product. So every single week we capture 90,000 points of differentiating differentiated customer data. Um, and we see what customers tell us about themselves. So their explicit and implicit preferences. And then we marry those things together and we start to build individualized uh, customer personas and algorithms for a recommendation. We are also able to roll that up at the macro level and say, you know, in Los Angeles, we see a, uh, a latent need for chicken center of the plate keto meals with Southeast Asian flavors. And then what we do is we go to our network of chefs and we say, do we have someone who's amazing at uh, chicken? Because chicken is really hard to make. We have somebody who's amazing at Southeast Asian food. And then we go out and we say, we're looking for something that kind of looks like this. And then the chef goes to their kitchen and they actually concept out in their kitchen and they think about the nuance of the spice and how the dish is going to come together. And our team of dietitians works with those chefs to make sure that everything is healthy. So all of our product is free of gluten, sugar, and dairy, inflammatory oils and processed foods. So it's a very, very clean product. Um, and then the chef essentially creates the dish. And then we launch it on our site. It takes about four weeks of innovation from data to plate. And then we watch the customer. We watch the customer and see what they like about it. We survey them. We capture implicit and explicit information. And then we iterate, iterate, iterate on it. Um, so our product is always evolving. And we use a very, very data-led process to do it. 
Uh, but that's why I came to Territory is mm. this incredible product that's enabled by incredible technology was the perfect marriage of my background with the opportunity to scale and direct to consumer. Wow, interesting. It, it, it's funny, you, you married two of my favorite things, food and data science. <laughs> mine too. I, mine too. I have to tell you, when I was working in CPG, I would sit in these insights meetings where an external agency like Shopper Marketing would come in and uh, I'll give you one about beer. And I, I don't rag on the beer industry because quite frankly, I think it gets a lot of bad rep anyhow. But mm -hmm. I'm sitting there um, and the insights were women are buying beer now. And mm -hmm. everyone was like, oh my God. And I was like, well, guys, how much do we just pay for this consumer insights? You could have just gone to the supermarket, see who's picking up the beer and talk to them about why they're buying it. Who's it for? Um, and so I was floored by the fact that the whole innovation cycle for the CPG industry is reliant on retailers and third-party shopper marketing to get the most basic of insights and just said, if you could create that one-to-one -one relationship with the customer where you know them so intimately and then attach it to a very fast innovation cycle, you can build a deeper relationship because you can tell the customer that you know them. You can show them that you know them. And I really believe that this is where all consumership is going, is this intimate relationships with brands and products that are enabled by data science. So great food plus data science is where I live. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned another one of my favorite things, beer. And I think I think that's why we're seeing more um, more beer with like orange and lemon and different types of fruits, correct? Yeah, I would say it's a couple of core things. Beer as a category has three major trouble issues. One, the female consumer is buying more than uh, more than ever in the past. And a lot of traditional beer marketing isn't made for the consumer, the female consumer. Um, two, there's a perception that beer is not healthy. And so beer, I think, is going towards natural flavors a lot to say, hey, like we are natural, we are healthy. Now, your own personal feelings on whether beer is healthy or not, it's fermented, it does have carbohydrates, but it is a natural product. And so it's gotten a little bit of a bad rep over the last couple of years. Um, and you'll see that like, this is why Bud, uh, Bud Light did something about like the purity of ingredients. And mm -hmm. nobody had ever been talking about that before. Um, and so really starting to play in that natural space because there's an emerging awareness of consumers, specifically millennials, and then certainly in Gen Z of this idea of who does medicine and what you put in your body really changes how you feel. Uh, and, and it's really interesting because how do you take something like beer, which is very recreational, uh, and, and tell the consumer that it's natural and tell them that it's okay. And they're fighting against elixirs and shrub and non-alcoholic as a category. So it's a lot of competition. And I think beer is doing a really smart thing. And then right. the third thing is the lack of premiumization in the category and just adding kind of more you know, developed flavors really helps beat this uh, perception that beer is not as kind of fancy as wine. Yeah. So so now now we can talk about the the uh, virus and the effect it had on your company because yeah. you're, you're a direct consumer and before COVID, you know, people were driving an hour to work and driving back. So they probably used, there's a certain group that probably used your, your product more and now all of a sudden they're home, like yeah. boom. <laughs> Yeah, I think by seven by three sixty five. So, how did it affect your company? Yeah, I mean, I think COVID was transformative for every company, whether they tell you it was or not. Um, it was definitely transformative for territory from for two key reasons. First and foremost, you're right. There was a massive customer shift. We had a huge amount of customers that were eating territory for kind of that workday lunch, and then those folks were at home, and all of a sudden they said now I'm going to bake bread. Do you remember when everyone was making bread last year? Yes. Um, and it was amazing to me because as a, a, a consumer insights person, I was like, where are you getting time to bake bread guys? Because I know, um, and we know at territory because we are a permanent remote work culture. So we're all work from home all the time. We do have offices, but we're work from home first. We know that the hardest thing about working from home is actually collapsing the hours in the day because you will start checking your phone at 7:30, 8 o'clock in the morning as you're eating breakfast you'll sign on for meetings let's say 9 10 11 12 and then your last one maybe is at 6 7 and then you're checking your phone and you're still engaging on slack you know until 8 9 or 10 the hardest part of work from home is actually the discipline to stop working yes. so how do you rectify the discipline to stop working that you need from work to home and like people being like i'm gonna bake bread um, and so what happened was, I think for folks that were not used to working from home, they were like, I'm going to go all natural. I'm going to make my own food. And then there was this like moment of, I can't handle this. And mm -hmm. I think culturally you hear about tons of burnout. I think Wall Street Journal said that, you know, 60% of uh, work from home workers are working on average two more hours than if they were working in the office. And that's counting commute time. Like those hours didn't come out of nowhere. And so now we're actually serving customers in a completely different way. 
because they're using us to offset the fact that they are putting so much more time into work and they're using us to stay healthy while they're at home because as people have been a lot more sedentary this year and you can see people are like over adopting into at-home fitness like peloton tonal mirror and things like that um, people are starting to say like how do i take care of myself in this environment where i don't want to go to a grocery store i don't have a ton of outdoor activity that i can be doing um, and i don't have any more time so it's interesting because we did shift out of that kind of I'm using territory for lunch or weekday dinner towards territory is a service in my life I can't live without. Mm -hmm. And we hear that more than ever. Um, our core customer for sure, but then we hear it in new emerging sectors like uh, working moms. It's a really interesting sector for us because people who used to have time in their schedule maybe to make dinner are saying, I can't do it anymore. And I need a really high quality product. I'm not gonna feed my family something that I wouldn't eat that I don't believe in. Um, and we're playing a huge role for territory with them. So it's always emerging, um, but I would say that I never want to say that 2020 was a good year. I think 2020 was a year that we really focused. We said, how do we lean into the core values of the company that we are to empower our customers and make their lives better? And how do we keep people healthy at this really important moment to do so? And then how do we help them solve the new challenges in their world that are around food? Because food mm -hmm. shouldn't be the hardest thing that you do every day. Yeah, and it'll be interesting when things go back to what they say is normal, how that's going to, because because I'm sure there's a lot of people that now love your product. Yeah. Right. And then they're going to go back to that old lifestyle. And I think I have a feeling you might actually see an actual increase in, in business. Correct. Yeah, I think so. Because listen, you're not going to get more time. Right. <laughs> like I think that's, that's the big thing. It's like, you don't get more time in any way. Time is like the one thing you can't buy more of. It's a limited factor. And so I, I always put my customer hat on and I say, okay, the customer that we're serving at home and let's say she's working two more hours than ever. And she's responsible for feeding her family. It's very, you know, friction heavy thing. Now she has to go back into the office. Like, does she have less stress on her shoulders or more? Does she have more time or less? And so what I think is now that people understand that you can get really high quality food delivered to you, that's not through seamless Grubhub or Uber Eats. We're not talking about, you know, mm -hmm you know, hundreds of dollars for one meal. That's all logistics costs. That doesn't really, you know, provide you any value. We're talking really great quality, healthy food that makes your life easier. They're never going to go back. Um, so it's a really, it's a, such a special moment because I will tell you before the pandemic, two to 4% of American consumers were buying food through e-commerce. So that was Instacart, Uber, e Uber Eats, Grubhub, everybody like that, us, two to 4%. Now it's 10 to 12% nationally. Mm. And wow. that's a huge shift. Yeah. And it's, it's holding. And what's amazing to me is we can see leading indicators in countries like, or in uh, states like Texas, where things have been open for a while and something's never even closed. You still see that super high adoption. And then we can look at, um, you know, China and what happened with SARS and the way that there is a massive adoption of e-commerce. And then once people are using e-commerce, they don't really go back. And that's what I think is going to happen, similar to what happened with uh, with apparel retail in the 2000s time frame. We're going to see that in food as well. And so it's, it's really exciting because I think the whole food landscape is shifting. Interesting. It's kind of funny. It seems like everything in life is becoming specialized where you just you you just give this part of your life to, to a company that you trust. Right. That's two things you said that are so important. Specialized in trust, mm -hmm. because as consumers, we are so lucky that we have the data that is going out in the world, that, co that companies are building things just for you, right? You don't have to take the kind of average number of SKUs to fit the most Americans anymore. You can get the personalized thing that fits your exact need. And that's enabled by the way that data flows in our world. So this is only enabled by technology. And then it's trust. Because I think trust is so important, especially in the world of food, mm -hmm. because you're literally putting it in your body 21 times a week. Like it's the most intimate thing you can do. Um, with the world of like Amazon and mass commoditization on the internet, it's incredibly hard to understand what quality is. And once you get that consumer's trust, it's usually by showing them. It's usually by proving it to them. Once you have that trust, it's the most valuable thing that a business can have. And so for us, we are focused just so much on maintaining that trust. And it's not just through consistency of product, but it's consistency in the operation that we have, the way that your package gets delivered. It's the consistency in customer service. We invest a lot in our customer care because we really want customers to feel like they have somebody to reach out to at Territory. Um, customers email me all the time. My email is lsm at territoryfoods.com. Anybody listening is welcome to email me. And I will personally email them back because I think that customer trust is the most valuable thing that we have. 
And it's our responsibility as a, as a company to build the products and services that reinforce that trust and continue to delight. And that's how you build a long-term relationship with the customer. Wow. And, and I must admit, it's very rare that a CEO gives out a, an email address, but that's great. So you that proves what you said. You, you are a trustworthy brand. So, so let's talk now about your company. Um, yeah. Because in order to do the things you're doing, my gut feeling is you couldn't do it with just the people in Washington, D.C., correct? Oh, my gosh. No. So by nature, our company is uh, remote distributed, as I said, but we actually work through local networks of chefs. So you're sitting in San Francisco Bay Area, and you are actually going to have a network of four to ten different chefs that are producing locally. So they're in Berkeley, they're in Oakland, they're in South Bay. Um, And so you're actually ordering locally, which is really, really powerful. Um, And to do that, we obviously have folks that sit locally in the San Francisco Bay Area as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's funny because one of the biggest things with COVID was, first and foremost, we were just so passionate about customer safety. And we said, first, how do we keep our customers as safe as possible? And safe for us means obviously like food safety, which is just in our blood and our veins. It's something we do very, very well. It was also our team safety in our operation and with our delivery drivers and making sure that we were, um, you know, making sure that we didn't put them in spaces that they weren't comfortable going if we couldn't, we didn't know who had been there, if they had been sanitized, things like that. Um, And then also because we have a lot of consumers and and that have a lot of severe medical disorders, we had people um, reaching out to us saying like, I'm immunocompromised, territory is the only way I'm able to eat right now. Like, can you help me? And so for us, on March 14th was really the day that I say COVID changed our business. Um, we looked inside ourselves and we said, what's the value of territory? And what are the values of the 42 people that we have sitting on our, on our Zoom call every single morning? Mm-hmm. Um, what are the values of us? And if we want to keep our customers safe and empowered, like how do we make sure that every single thing we do and every dollar that we spend this year is just hyper-focused on that customer? And we drove a ton of innovation out of that. We launched a whole bunch of business lines, a whole bunch of new products. We launched some products that'll live forever and some products that will just happily die. Uh, We got into the grocery business very, very briefly during COVID because Mm -hmm. we had customers that were like, I can't go to the grocery store. The line at Ralph's is 45 minutes long. I can't do this. I have to go to work. Like, please, please, please. And we said, okay. What can we do? We have access to a completely differentiated supply chain because we have, um, you know, we have this network of chefs and restaurants. How do we activate them and how do we get that supply chain moving? And so I had like U.S. foods representatives calling me saying, you know, all the restaurants that I serve are completely shut down. Like, do you have a place for all this food to go? Mm. And it was just such a moment of our whole food supply chain is broken. And as somebody who started their career in like supply chains, logistics, operations, and technology, I was like, this is something we can fix. And territory is an end solution, but we are also just informing and how do we change the whole food supply chain? I'm very passionate about it. Um, So we as a company went really deep in our values and saying, how do we become, how do we become even more important to those customers? And how do we keep our own team safe? Um, And then how do we enable innovation in this environment? So we're lucky that we were remote before because when everyone else, I sat in a, uh, I sat in a uh, Washington business leaders kind of like round table and there was a law firm on and they were like, oh my God, we don't know what to do. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know what to do? And they were like, people don't have laptops. We don't have a way for people to communicate. We've never had meetings where not everyone was in the room. And I was blown away Mm. because it's just so crazy to me to not have evolved the way that you, that you work and evolve the way that you find Mm. employees and engage them um, that I felt really lucky that we were just ahead of the game in that moment. Yeah, that's great. And, and to, to finish, I'm going to ask you a, a question I don't normally ask because uh, of what you do. And you very, I mean, you're obviously very well versed in, 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 in the food industry uh, and the Bay Area. I know there's a lot of technology and research going into meatless, mm-hmm. uh, meatless meat or meat that is built in a um, lab meat. A lab meat, yes. So are you looking into that, those sources of food? Yes. Okay, so we have a lot of feelings about this because for us, we want to make sure when we're talking about food, we're really staying core to the the anti-inflammatory clean values that we have. So I mentioned our food is free of gluten, sugar, and dairy, and then anti-inflammatory in terms of oils. So we don't use canola oil or safflower oil, we use olive oil, um, which most people don't really understand that like some oils cause tons of inflammation in the body, which makes you feel sluggish. It makes you heavier. It can lead to chronic illness, like leaky gut, SIBO, things like that. 
Um, but then we have this feeling on processing. And a lot of these kind of new alternate proteins are heavily processed. So we have a lot of like emotion and feeling about it because the other side of our house is we're very sustainably focused. Um, so 100% of our meal container is compostable, not just recyclable, compostable, including mm. the top. It looks like plastic, but it's a very cool product called PLA, which is a corn fiber plastic. Um, and then 100% of the pack out. So the cold pack that you get when you get a territory delivery to your home is 100% recyclable. And we lead the way. Every one of our competitors is using single use plastic. They're using materials that don't really like care. And they're doing it because they want more, more dollars, more margin, right? Everyone has a lot of pressure to uh, grow more margin out of these businesses. For us, our values are on sustainability for the environment and for our customers. And so we've made a stance to have more expensive materials that are better for the environment. Um, and so we, you know, obviously the same pressure to grow and with margin and things like that, we try to find it other places, honestly. But back to the idea of new kind of plant-based meats, we look for items that are minimally processed and we look for items that really drive uh, health and wellness and really drive what we're looking for for our customers. So in San Francisco Bay Area, we're working with a company that makes something called Koji. Um, and it's delicious. It's very natural kind of meat alternative. Um, we have right now on the menu, I think we have like a Koji chicken satay and a Koji beef curry. Um, and we really love to understand if our customers like it. And then um, for other plant-based protein, we really go like, let's talk about chickpeas. Let's talk about quinoa. Let's talk about mushrooms. Let's talk about natural foods that have existed for a really long time um, that have a lot of the great properties that you want um, and making sure that you're getting a balanced meal without the perception of needing like a meat or meat alternative. Interesting. So um, I could talk to you for hours because we've touched on almost a lot of my favorite topics. But I, we, we do have to get back to our, our day jobs, right? So, but I want to thank Absolutely. you, Alice, for your time today. It's been fascinating talk to, talking to you. And um, I think I'm going to go on and um, order one of your products today or tomorrow. I love it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was wonderful. And love talking to you and your community about the amazing company that is Territory. All right. Thank, have a great week.